This is Daybreak Asia. We're counting down to Asia's major market open. So just a few moments from Japan and South Korea coming online. The focus today also really on what's happening in mainland equities, China stocks, Hong Kong as well. This reaction still coming through to Beijing, eyeing new measures to try and stabilize what's been a really failing and falling equity market pool. Yeah, that's right. We uh, have been reporting uh, talk of a huge package to stabilize those markets to the tune of around about $278 billion. China's got a bit of a mixed history, though, when it comes to propping up markets. So uh, well, let's see if that can turn things around, Bell. Yeah, that's right. If, if history is a guide, we have actually seen those sorts of measures really falling short in the past. But uh, the open here for Japan and South Korea at the start of the day, some eco data to note because we just had the trade numbers coming out for Japan for December. Uh, we saw that trade surplus narrowing to 62 billion yen in the former month or prior month. Exports as well uh, rising pretty much in line with estimates, but recovering as from the November reading. So perhaps a good signal of, of the demand for chips and exports of, of materials given that Japan dominates that sector. Imports as well one to track and we had those numbers coming out in turn still in negative territory. Uh, what else are watching in the session is just the reaction to still the BOJ that, that hold yesterday in the session didn't really see too much movement coming through in the FX space because the Japanese yen there are continuing to, to sit around that 148 level, that differential between what we see in treasuries and the 10-year yield in focus. And we do actually see the 10-year yield there jumping the highest in a month. Uh, let's change on because we've got the start of trade for Korea in turn and a little bit of weakness creeping through, which isn't really reflective of, of the Wall Street session. Uh, the focus there was very much on the earnings numbers that came through and we'll get more on Netflix in a moment, Texas Instruments, that was a weaker forecast so perhaps actually that could be playing into it given Texas Instruments, major chip maker name and, and a weak revenue forecast coming through from the company so we'll track those shares, how they come online. The Korean won, meanwhile you continue to see just a little bit of, of currency weakness there. We have seen it moving past its 200 day moving average. The question is whether it pulls back, consolidates that level, Paul. Let's take a look at how we're doing uh, here in this part of the world. Uh, we've been trading on the ASX now for a little over an hour. And uh, we're sort of flat at the moment. It's a bit of a mixed picture for, in terms of sectors. One sector performing pretty well, though, is materials. And some of the smaller names that are doing quite well, uh, Luca, the best performing stock at the moment. This uh, digs up mineral sands, titanium ore, uh, Northern Star, Pilbara, uh, some of the uh, smaller gold and iron ore miners doing quite well as well. And the lithium miner, Lion Town also rebounding after a difficult week or so. Uh, we've got uh, not a lot of action in terms of the Aussie bond space and the dollar uh, still just below 66 cents US. The oil price pretty quiet as well considering the situation in the Middle East. 74.43 for New York crude at the moment uh, as the US and the UK continue uh, that security operation in the Red Sea. Not a lot of movement in the US bond space either as trading opens in Tokyo. Uh, we did see yields creeping up in the U.S. session, all except the two-year, and that theme uh, seems to be extending into Asia trade. Uh, of course, we're keeping an eye on the political situation in the U.S. as well, Annabelle, as we uh, await results from the New Hampshire primary. Yeah, that's right. We've got the polls closing in an hour. We understand no official uh, result could be called until that point in time. But we'll be watching for reporting from uh, various news outlets. But uh, Nikkei just coming online, as we said, a little bit lower here this morning. Uh, still, though, it's been a very, very impressive start to the year for Japanese equities. And let's get more on that with Ken Wong, Asian equity portfolio spe specialist at East Spring Investments. So Ken, thanks for joining us this morning. Yeah, the Nikkei's up m more than 9% this year. So... Yeah. Is that sort of move justified, do you think? Yeah, the fact is, is that if you're looking at Japanese stocks from a large cap perspective, valuation seems to be slightly a bit higher than what it was you know, previously. But the fact is, is that there's a lot of mid small caps, which are still looking very attractive when it comes to valuations. We've got over 40% of both small mid cap stocks, which are trading well below book, one times book. And in particular, you know, when we've seen the rally, it's predominantly have been on large caps. So we think that you know, opportunities in a small mid cap space is definitely there. And the fact is, is that you know, with the BOJ not doing anything 
at least for the next couple months. The fact is, is that there does seem to be more opportunities when it comes to, you know, more appropriate, you know, policies to help support the stock market as a whole. And are there any sectors that you're preferring in particular? Yeah, I mean, the fact is, is that industrials we like, we like specifically to consumer related names, you know, even financials we still like, but then, you know, we think that valuations are a little bit trophy and we're taking a bit of profit in that sector. You have to be a bit more careful in terms of what we're going for. Um, again, the sectors we don't like in particular is some of the higher growth areas because in terms of valuations, they are a bit trophy or some of the larger mega caps in which where we think valuations are a bit high. Um, we also have this uh, narrative which seems to be enduring after yesterday's BOJ decision that uh, we are going to get normal rates when we get to April. Um, but is that going to be it? Can you see a scenario where rates actually go above zero in Japan? Well, it could. And the fact is that I think it's going to be more important to see what happens when it comes to the overall markets as a whole. Now, the fact is, is that if we do get to that point, you know, that then there are signals that specifically that there's a very strong rise when it comes to overall economic growth, potentially that, you know, they think that inflation numbers are going to be normalized. And more importantly, wage growth as well as consumption uh, is going up significantly. I think these are all going to be important factors in order for the BOJ, in order to raise interest rates higher than you know the zero level now the fact is is that that is not a base case scenario but with that said you know the BOJ is very much closely looking into what's happening in Japan I think over the next few months it's going to be very important to see you know how strongly we're going to see in terms of overall economic growth you know we have the Chinese New Year holiday coming up in particular there's going to be definitely a lot more tourists visiting uh, Japan over the next few weeks and as a result you know that's going to help but I think more importantly it's going to be you know overall with the domestic consumption how strongly that rises in the next few months in order for the BOJ to see whether or not you know, more appropriate actions are needed. Uh, Ken, we've got to get your views also on what's going on with equities in Hong Kong and China, a pretty severe route uh, since the start of the year. How much deeper do you see this getting and uh, do you view it as a buying opportunity? Um, we see it as a buying opportunity for more medium to longer term investors. Now, the fact is, is that with the news and the, with some of the, uh, the information that came out yesterday, I think it's going to be important to take a bit of a you know, step back to see what particular stocks will be impacted and in particular, specifically, how the plan will be in place. Because, again, there's still a lot of market chatter until we see official news that comes out and in particular what's going to happen in terms of the amount of coverage, in terms of uh, you know, which particular stocks and which particular uh, markets that would cover then you know we would be more inclined but ultimately I think what you know what was announced or what was disclosed yesterday um, in terms of uh, various news outlets and in terms of specifically what is going to happen you know we still are a bit more reserved and we want to wait to see specifically what's going to happen before taking a bit more of a reaction to this there's sort of like there's the China market because it's cheap. There's India because you see structural growth perhaps. And yep. then there's the Japan story as well with, with all of the host of uh, corporate governance reforms, weak again, etc. Where do you see the best value? In the short term, I mean, we think that India and Japan still you know, has opportunities because the fact is, is that with India, you know, we're still, you know, run up to elections and the market will continuously still be very, you know, bullish in terms of what's happening there, especially with all the various fiscal policies that, you know, Prime Minister Modi is doing. But and also in terms of Japan, because of the very relaxed, you know, in terms of monetary policies, there's definitely going to be benefits there. But if you're looking at more medium to longer term, given where valuations are, I think if you look at the valuations, for, for instance, the HSI, or more importantly, let's say the Hang Seng Tech, you look at the PE is more is very comparable with the price to book for the Nasdaq. You know, in terms of when we look at you know PE valuations on the HSI and Hang Seng Tech, compare that with the Nasdaq price to book, they're not that far off, right? On a price to book comparing price to earnings. So from a valuation basis, we definitely see that China makes a lot more sense. But we do understand that you know shorter term, there's still going to be a lot of question marks and negative sentiment to overcome. Just very quickly, it's been so hard to call the bottom for Chinese equities and plenty of people have got it wrong. Correct. Do you think that this is actually the bottom now? It's very hard to say. I mean, the fact is I don't have a crystal ball to tell you whether or not that's going to be the case. But, you know, we think that this is a start in terms of especially if the government is, you know, inclined to actually, you know, inject a lot more, you know, capital and, you know, help the markets. But that's only a start. There needs to be a lot more needed in order to really build the confidence because I think this is one of the key things that's lacking for both domestically based investors as well as overseas investors.
investors. All right. Ken Wong, thanks for your time. That was Ken Wong, Asian Equity Portfolio Specialist at eSpring Investments. Still ahead, WWE President Nick Khan talks about the company's $5 billion deal with Netflix as the streaming giant makes its first big bet on live events. But up next, we'll get the latest live from New Hampshire on the showdown between Donald Trump and his remaining Republican challenger, Nikki Haley. This is Bloomberg. Watching Daybreak Asia, some breaking news here on eBay because the company has just announced that it's cutting about 1,000 roles. That's about 9% of its total workforce. Now, what's driving that decision is that uh, eBay says that it needed to better organize teams for speed. And they're saying as well that headcount expenses have outpaced the growth of the business. Uh, they're also requesting all U.S. employees to work from home on Wednesday. But they're saying that these, this headcount reduction, scaling back about 1,000 roles, is going to be something that results in a more focused, a more agile, a more responsive company as well. So eBay shares, you can see there, they are just climbing fractionally in after hours trade so far, Paul. All right, thanks, Bell. Uh, a new poll suggests uh, Donald Trump has gained the most from the exit of Ron DeSantis from the Republican presidential race, opening now a 22-point lead over Nikki Haley. Uh, voting's now underway in New Hampshire's primary. In fact, it's getting towards the end now. Uh, Haley is, of course, the last major challenger standing between the former president and the party's nomination. Well, Bloomberg's political news director, Jody Schneider, joins us from Manchester in New Hampshire. Uh, Jody, some of the polling booths are closed. It's not long towards the end now. Um, how unusual is this to be effectively a two-person race at this stage and could by the end of the night it all be over? Yeah, well, it's very unusual, Paul. Uh, usually, uh, New Hampshire, which is the first primary, Iowa was a caucus. Usually, you have, uh, you know, a much a bigger stage of candidates still in the race. So it's very unusual. We had several drop out um, just recently, including Ron DeSantis on Sunday. And what that means is it's it's Nikki Haley's, um, you know, sort of stand against Donald Trump. He is uh, widely expected to win, but New Hampshire has proven. Uh, the pollsters wrong time and time again. This is a state that does, um, you know, goes against the grain. And so that's what she and her supporters are hoping for tonight. She is uh, expected to do well among moderate Republicans against um, uh, moderate, you know, uh, people who, who might not call themselves Republicans necessarily, who are independents. Uh, and uh, she is hoping that that will be enough to get her over the finish line, if not to a win, to a very close second to Donald Trump to be able for her to continue her campaign uh, past uh, tonight. Uh, the question is, will she be able to do that? Will it make sense to do that? If she has a lot of momentum coming out of here, she will get more uh, donors interested. If she doesn't, it will be hard to uh, continue, both from a financial standpoint and also uh, Donald Trump does have that kind of, he is trying very hard to be the effective, uh, you know, the last man standing, the effective general election nominee for the Republican Party as soon as he can. There's such a sense of, of inevitability in this campaign so far and this, this understanding that Trump will be the, the sort of presumptive nominee here, but is the die really already cast or does Nikki Haley have the opportunity to, to actually lure out voters and change people's opinions in time? Yeah, and that's that's a real question, Annabelle. Can can she really uh, make a difference, enough of a difference? It's so early here, but if she doesn't do well here, and with it just being the two of them, uh, it's hard to see how she can continue for much longer. South Carolina is the next big contest. It's in about a month, but uh, she's from there. That's her home state. She was governor there, but Donald Trump is looking. Um, 
very strong there already. He see, he's a well ahead of her. And the question is, if she does look like she's uh, she doesn't do well enough tonight, would she stay in the race another month with what would be expected to be kind of punishing blows from Donald Trump, uh, you know, in terms of uh, att verbal attacks and, and attacks on her credibility, and then to go into a race in South Carolina where she may lose her home state. So those will be the questions that will be asked. Another question that will be asked is if we are, if it's inevitable that we are going to get the same matchup as in 2020 between uh, Biden and Trump, do, uh, does this uh, really end up in a third party candidacy? Some groups such as No Labels have been talking about this, saying if this is who we're going to get, they, they've been raising money for, and they may go find a candidate to be a third party candidate. So that's another thing we will be watching closely in coming weeks, depending on uh, how she does tonight. Uh, we'll also see how, uh, how strongly Donald Trump does against um, not only, obviously, his core base, but among more moderate and more independent voters. That will be an interesting thing to watch as we see the returns tonight. Yeah, still a number of variables here, uh, not the least of which is uh, Donald Trump's uh, numerous court battles as well. Is there some benefit in that respect of Nikki Haley uh, just keeping this campaign rolling and, and staying on the bench? Well, and that's certainly been one of her arguments, that she is the less chaos candidate, and that he, with him comes chaos. Some have said, well, if she hangs on long enough, you know, maybe there, there will be enough legal trouble that will um, require there to be an alternative to Donald Trump. But so far, the legal wranglings have not seemed to hurt him, certainly not with his support among core Republican voters. Uh, he goes from the campaign trail to the courthouse these days a lot. And um, at the court, he's making the, the case that he these are people People, uh, these cases, uh, as he keeps calling them, are witch hunts and are desired, are designed effectively to keep him from running for president again, to keep him from being president again. And he's been able to really use that argument well among his supporters. They, they haven't really taken that up. So he really has sort of been campaigning from the courthouse as well. Now, an indictment would be a whole, not an indictment is one thing, a conviction would be a whole other thing. And we've seen a fair bit of polling that, uh, that that's what could would cause some Republicans to really uh, decide not to vote for him, or certainly a question whether to vote for him if they are uh, if there is a conviction on any of these charges. All right, polls are closing in about 40 minutes from now. That was Bloomberg's political news director, Jody Schneider, in Manchester for us. And we're going to have special coverage of the New Hampshire primary starting in the next hour. That's at 8 p.m. Eastern time on the U.S. East Coast. That's 9 a.m. in Hong Kong. This is Bloomberg. Watching Daybreak Asia, taking a look at some of the movers in response to Texas Instruments. That's the U.S. chip maker, and it, it gave a pretty disappointing quarterly forecast after hours. So we've seen that stock slumping, and in turn, it is weighing on other major chip makers or semiconductor names in this part of the world as well. So uh, there's there's been a bit of a pullback in demand for industrial, for automotive, electric components, and that's what really dragged on Texas Instruments. You can see down nearly five percent in after hours. Yeah. What is moving a little bit better in after hours trade from US names is Netflix and uh, that company or the streaming giant signing up more than 13 million customers in the latest quarter. It's the best numbers we've actually seen for the company going back to the early days of the pandemic. Uh, streaming names in, in Korea, we can also track those. These are some of the production companies that have supplied or do supply content into Netflix as well. Uh, let's get more on those numbers from the US giant uh, Bloomberg Suki. Keenan joins us from New York. And uh, Sue, let's just kick off with what we had from Netflix after the bell. Well, this is far better than anyone expected. It literally blew away Wall Street expectations. As mentioned, this is the best ever holiday quarter for Netflix. Uh, you have to go back to when people were literally locked indoors to get this kind of growth. The addition of more than 13 million customers certainly caused the share to surge. At one point, it was up uh, better than 8.8 .8 or 8.9%, and it's expected now to give a lift to the NASDAQ at the store. 
part of Wednesday U.S. trading. Uh, it's important to point out that the addition of subscribers beat projections in every region of the globe, with more than 5 million customers added in Europe, the Mideast, and Africa alone. Fourth quarter sales came in at over $8.8 billion. And Netflix did warn that the growth will slow a bit to start the new year, but that this should not hurt sales growth. The streamer said it will continue to boost revenue at a double-digit rate, in part by raising rates, which it has been doing now for several years. Now, post-pandemic, it did seem that Netflix had hit a ceiling on growth, and it is crediting its crackdown on password sharing, the introduction of a cheaper advertising-supported option, and its strong slate of hit programs uh, with this rebound. Uh, Netflix still makes most of its money from people who pay to watch films and TV shows on demand, but it's started to invest in both live programming and video games. And on the subject of live programming, ahead of its earnings, the streamer announced it paid $5 billion for exclusive rights to WWE programming. Yeah, let's uh, get a little bit more on this. We did, of course, uh, hear from the WWE president a bit earlier. Let's, let's have a listen. Live event programming is something we've talked about for quite a while, and this has been in the works. So you should look at this as fits inside of our $17 billion programming spend now. I would not look at this as a, a signal of any other change or any change to our sports strategy. Well, that was the Netflix president there. We did hear from the WWE president as well, though. Uh, but uh, this uh, tie-up, uh, $5 billion over 10 years, I believe, is this a potential game-changer? Yeah, that, that is pretty much what uh, many observers are saying. They really view it as a knockout punch. And co-CEO Ted Sarandos, who you just heard from, is pointing out that the WWE has a multi-generational fan base that will grow on Netflix, he believes, especially overseas. And what you're looking at is the these programs that include Raw and other live events. Um, and what World Wrestling Entertainment uh, has done is given uh, Netflix the exclusive rights uh, to now be the home for all of its shows. Netflix plans to air three hours of live wrestling weekly, according to Bloomberg reporting. And under the terms of the deal, sources say Netflix agreed to pay $5 billion over uh, 10 years. Now, Raw will air exclusively on Netflix in the U.S., in Canada, Latin America, and other international markets starting in January 2025. Um, you're looking at shares of TKO Group, which owns WWE, which surged as much as 24 percent. So investors here, huge uh, supporters of the deal. And again, it's an agreement that would allow Netflix to bring in millions of new viewers, uh, multi-generational viewers, and also boost its fledgling advertiser-supported plan. All right, Bloomberg, Sue Keenan there on the Netflix earnings. Other corporate stories that we're tracking, uh, one of YouTube's biggest stars, Jimmy Donaldson, better known as Mr. Beast, has made his surprise debut on Chinese video service Billy Billy. It's a rare move by a global influencer into China's internet space that bans most Western social media. Donaldson also plans to launch accounts on other sites, including Douyin and Weibo, in the coming months. Alibaba's U.S.-listed shares jumped after the New York Times reported that founder Jack Ma and chairman Joe Tsai had been buying in. The report says Ma bought around $50 million worth of stock in the fourth quarter, while Tsai's family vehicle investment vehicle took $152 million worth. Alibaba was once the most valuable company in China, but it's fallen behind rivals Tencent and PDD. United Airlines is no longer counting on Boeing's largest 737 MAX model as manufacturing lapses threaten to further delay an aircraft that's already years behind schedule. United has not cancelled its order for the MAX 10, but has removed it from internal planning. Analysts say heightened scrutiny from U.S. safety regulators could delay certification of the MAX 10. Shares of Texas Instruments slipped after the chipmaker delivered a disappointing quarterly forecast. It says sales in the first quarter could reach up to $3.75 billion, and that is lower than the average estimate of $4 billion. The outlook suggests a rebound in orders from key sectors taking longer than expected. We have plenty more to come on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg.
right, let's take a look at what's going on in the China bond space. Uh, we have seen uh, locals heading for the relative safety of bonds in China because, of course, we've seen a, a fair bit of uh, activity. Um, I beg, I beg your pardon. Let's get over to Bell for a moment. We've got some breaking news out of Japan. Yeah, Paul, just the Jibun Bank PMI numbers coming out for the month of January. These are the preliminary readings coming through. But for the manufacturing reading, that actually ticked a little bit higher to 48. So it was 47.9. So really just uh, pretty much unchanged from the prior month. Otherwise, we saw services, uh, composite, both of those readings continuing to hold above the 50 level. And both of those actually improving a little bit from, from November or December readings as well. It does really follow what came through with the trade data earlier because it was strong numbers coming through for December. Uh, it's something that could perhaps as well support fourth quarter GDP, but the signs coming through that we're seeing better exports for cars and better exports of chips as well, and that includes uh, chip-making equipment to, to China, Paul. All right. Uh, as I was saying, uh, we have seen uh, the stock route, uh, seeing uh, some uh, Chinese investors uh, abandoning equities for the safety of bonds. Of course, uh, concerns mounting uh, about the deteriorating, deteriorating economic outlook there. We've had uh, yields on 30-year government notes dropping to almost the lowest in two decades. Um, and of course, we have seen the CSI 300 plunging to about a five-year low. Uh, obviously, some serious concerns about what's happening in China's economy. Uh, policymakers, meanwhile, uh, uh, well, we have reports of a $278 billion stabilization fund uh, to put a floor under equities prices. But in the meantime, uh, term deposits, government bonds seem to be the place to be for uh, China's investments, Bell. Yeah, well, certainly uh, that's that's where we are seeing a lot of investors pulling their money or putting their money because of what we've seen in the equity market. And, and the plan to stem the, the current stock route that came through with that potential uh, stabilisation fund yesterday are certainly facing a lot of scepticism as well, given that there's question marks over the sustainability of us. Uh, as we reported yesterday, uh, Bloomberg saying that authorities could be considering a rescue package backed by almost $280 billion. Our China economy at Editor Jill, Jill Desus joins us now. So, Jill, this sort of stabilization fund, this sort of money being put into it, does it tell you that that the the equity market moves are really becoming something that could threaten social stability, given how much retail investment makes up the, the investment mix? Yes, I mean, I think you have to look at the timing of all of this, right? We're coming just two days after uh, the Premier, Li Chong, was talking about the need to stabilize these markets. Now we're reporting that this plan is under consideration. Maybe we'll get more details before the end of the week. Um, and point out, of course, that uh, we've seen this before in China, right? You have to go back to the 2015 uh, stock route where, uh, you know, China really called in the national teams, these policy-oriented ideas to sort of, um, you know, bring more money and stabilize uh, what's happening within the, the stock market. Obviously, uh, you know, it takes some time for that to kind of uh, um, come into effect. I think you'd also could argue that some of those measures at that time were fairly counterproductive and that ultimately it still took about a year to really arrest the stock route. So I'm not sure that this is going to have, you know, sort of that big oomph uh, that the Chinese government is expecting, especially, you know, it does depend on how this comes into effect. I mean, if we're seeing something to the tune of about uh, 280, um, you know, a billion dollars kind of uh, coming into the market. Is that going to be all at once? Is that going to be something that's more of a drip factor? Um, this is coming from offshore funds, apparently. Are the, how are those SOEs getting that money? I think there's still a lot of questions to be asked. And at this point, obviously, investors, as we're seeing, aren't extremely impressed at what they've uh, what they've heard so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still a lot of questions, uh, but I think it's something like 60% of uh, the equity market in China is held by retail investors, and these are the same retail investors who in many cases have had an absolutely awful experience with the property market and continue to. So is this really going to do much to uh, prop up confidence? Well, I think you really hit the nail on the head there. Uh, no, I mean, the idea is that there are these um, underlying issues within the Chinese economy that, yes, as you said, these retail investors are really, really paying attention to. I mean, we're in the fourth year at this point of this ongoing property market crisis. Uh, we've seen various measures attempted to, um, you know, sort of prop up the property market, or at least stem that, that, that fall and find a floor under things. We saw, you know, various easings of uh, mortgage rates last year. That didn't really seem to move the needle too much. Um, so that continues to be a major 
major drain on confidence, and we've seen that really feed through into significant issues with the economy. I mean, look at a lot of the deflationary pressures that still exist that sort of risks creating that spiral where people just continue to save money because uh, they don't really see any more reason to spend. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we're, we're looking at some pretty serious confidence issues within the Chinese economy that are really holding people back from spending. Um, you know, a, a big stock market plan like this might move the needle in the short term, but I think there's a lot of serious questions about what it actually means uh, for long-term sustainability here. All right, China Economy Editor Jill Desis there. Thanks for joining us. Let's get over to Jia Hei Chen, our CIO at Novin RK Key Technologies. Uh, Jia Hei, I know you have a slightly different view on the equities picture in China, but just to give a bit of background here, it's not been a great year so far. We've got the Hang Seng, uh, the entire index now trading below book. I think it's off about 12% in the first 20 odd days of the year. The CSI at a five year low, as uh, Jill was outlining there, uh, consumer confidence and investor confidence among ordinary Chinese about this plan isn't great either, considering their experience with the property market. You say the selling's irrational. Why? Well, uh, I wouldn't say the selling is irrational. I mean, if you look at the market, it's always been irrational from you know, time to time. The market was really a bull market back in 2020 and 2021, and now we have a market keep on selling off. So you, you, you never get a rational market from you know from time to time. But I would say this is a very good opportunity to buy if you look at the valuation of the companies. I just uh, took a look of the valuation of the Shenzhen Composite Index uh, last night. If you compare the PB ratio of this index over the past 30 years, you can see that this is one of the lowest points. It, it got about uh, six or seven times that it hit this low point in the past 30 years. And every time if you buy at that point, uh, the longest time you will be waiting is like one year or two years. The shortest time is about three to six months. And you get a rebound that is very large. So I would say, you know, when everyone hates them, okay, you, you would love it. Yeah, there's certainly no doubt that it's looking cheap and valuations are looking very attractive. But it was around about this time yesterday uh, that Bloomberg broke the story of Asia Genesis uh, shutting its hedge fund uh, because its China bets went sideways and have failed to pick the bottom. Is picking the bottom of this market the new widowmaker trade? Well, you know, uh, if they have been keep on picking companies that is out of favor rather than chasing companies that were too expensive in the past three years, I don't really think they have to shut uh, shut, sh shut down their fund. I mean, because our record has been about around 10% for the, for the past three years. So we accumulated about 40% over three years' time. And this year, we lost about 3 to 4% yet. So uh, the, the reason we've been doing that is we keep on buying companies that is not favored by the market. I mean, not those tech companies, not, not those very, you know, expensive new energy companies, but we kept on buying companies that is, you know, uh, undervalued, uh, trading at about three to four or five times PE ratios, uh, seven or eight uh, percent of dividend yield. And our record has been pretty good. So I would say is that if you look at Chinese market, I mean, the retail investors is taking up about 60 to 80 percent of the trading value over here. So market, the, the, the market price between companies has always been uh, quite mispricing. You find companies that are very expensive and you find a company Companies that are very cheap, um, and you keep on looking for these companies that are undervalued, and pick 30 or 40 of them. Your record wouldn't be really too bad. So, what are the companies or sectors that you think are undervalued then? Well, we, we can't say too much about the companies uh, because we are uh, prohibit. Uh, you know, we, we can't be doing that. But well, I can talk about sectors. Um, currently, we have about 80 percent of our, um, uh, vet, uh, our our portfolio in Hong Kong market, basically the state-owned large companies, uh, and 20 percent in Asia. We've got things like banks, uh, port companies, uh, wind power, uh, you know, metro service, all these kind of things. Uh, so, so we've been buying all these companies. Uh, I think we're currently holding about 39 companies uh, in all these sectors. And they're the ones that you think that, that, that haven't been loved so far? Because SOEs have been sort of an investor favourite. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it really differs. Some some com some people love um, as some kind of SOEs. For example, the, the the wine. I mean, the wine company, the spirit company. They have been trading at a very expensive valuation over the past few years. Uh, people love them. They were SOEs, but people still love them. So we keep on looking for the SOEs that are you know not really liked too much uh, by others, and we come on, keep on trading between these companies. For example, about one year ago, when I was on Bloomberg, I said we uh, we favor nuclear plants because at that time. 
time, nobody really loved the nuclear plants. But now people started looking for nuclear plants, and their valuation rose up a bit compared to wind power companies. So we did a trading days ago to switch uh, from the nuclear plants, uh, nuclear generating power companies, uh, to, to wind, uh, wind power companies. And we are pretty happy with that trade because that increased our uh, book value and dividend yield and earning by about 50% uh, just by a trade. You know? So uh, we have been reporting today that there's a stabilisation fund potentially on the way, uh, quite a big one, $278 billion. I'm, I'm interested if you think that's going to effectively put a floor under this market or if there are any other sort of reforms or, or stimulus measures that you would like to see that might be helpful. Well, we haven't got uh, confirmation about that news yet, but we have saw so everybody's been talking about that. Uh, we really have no idea about where the you know, bottom floor really is. Maybe this will do that, maybe it will not. I mean, look at the Hong Kong stock market. If you look at the SOEs in Hong Kong, you see the valuation that you can't really believe that. You've got like three times PE ratio, uh, 0.3 or four times PB ratio, and about 10% dividend yield for many companies. It, it's, it's not a stock market, I mean, it's 1929 this valuation, if you look at that. So so this valuation, well, with this valuation, you don't know where the bottom is, uh, to be frank. But if you don't use the leverage, you don't care about where the bottom is. You can just keep on trading between these companies, and you'll see the fundamental of your portfolio increase at about 30% a year. And you're pretty happy about that. You don't mind where the floor is. What it, you can actually track a bit more than perhaps the bottom is also the, the volatility. And we have seen the so-called fear gauge for Hong Kong uh, just falling back from a five-year high or five-month high rather on Tuesday. So it, it does tell you perhaps that, that, yeah, there has been a sort of a sentiment shift for, for investors given that potential uh, sort of rescue package. But how long is that going to last? How, how, how positive do you think that the sentiment can persist? What sort of time frame? Well, I have been uh, in China's market since uh, 2006, so it's been about uh, 18 years right now. And I try to avoid myself from predicting where this market will go. I mean, this market is, you just don't know where the short-term movement will be in like six months' time. It can go like, uh, you know, uh, I remember a time when, when that was in 2014. The market rose by about 100% in just a two months' time. And just before that two months, everyone was, uh, you know, pessimistic like they are right now. So I still remember that time, and uh, people were so um, dark about the market. They think the market is never going to rebound again. And two months later, we saw the market rebounded by 100%. So I never try to do this. I, it's, it's just uh, too difficult. Uh, what I do is that I increase the value uh, of my portfolio by keep on trading uh, between companies, you know, sell the companies that have been rising and uh, buy the companies that are not noticed by the market. And I keep on doing this. I got my uh, value increased by about 30% uh, per year. And, and that's fine. Uh, I, I just never try to predict where, where the market is going. It's just way too difficult. But on that level of pessimism, I'm interested because, as you say, you've been investing in, in these equities for, for many years now. So the amount of, of investor negativity at this point for this episode, how would you say it compares back to, to previous experiences? Well, this is one of the worst. I would say this is one of the worst. Let me name a few worst ones uh, that is comparable to this one. Think about uh, 2005. Um, that was a very uh, bad bear market. The market has been falling for four or five straight years back from uh, 2000. So people were just leaving the market at that time. And then came the 2008. The market plunged uh, from you know the, the point of 6,000 to 1,600 in just about 10 months' time. So that was horrible. Uh, and then you, you had uh, 2014, and this is, this time is also uh, another bear market. So I think you, at least you got like four times uh, of people being uh, so bearish about the market in the past 20 years. All right, that was Jia Chen, CIO at Novum Archie Technologies, joining us about 45 minutes away from the open of mainland equities and Hong Kong. But uh, for those charts that we use as well, you can uh, interact with the charts shown using GTV Go. Browse recent charts featured on Bloomberg TV, and you can catch up on key analysis, save charts for future reference as well. So that's for Bloomberg subscribers. More ahead, this is Bloomberg.
You're watching Daybreak Asia. Some of the stories we're following around the world. Australia's Prime Minister is reportedly set to announce changes to income tax cuts due to come in effect in July. It's a politically risky move after Anthony Albanese pledged ahead of the 2022 election there would be no alterations to the package. Local media reports say a 37% tax rate will be retained for earnings over 135,000 Australian dollars, with a top rate of 45% kicking in at 190,000. Thailand's Constitutional Court will rule later on Wednesday whether opposition politician Peter Linja-Roinrat breached election rules while running for parliament. This opposition used the claim to block his prime ministerial bid last year. Peter's Move Forward party won almost 40% of the popular vote in the May election for the platform that included loosening defamation protections for the Thai royal family. Israel and Hamas have reportedly agreed in principle to exchange Israeli hostages for Palestinian prisoners during a possible month-long ceasefire. Reuters cites unidentified sources saying a deal is being held up by differences over a permanent truce to end the war. The report says civilians will be freed first, followed by soldiers. Annabelle. Well, Paul, South Africa's Justice Minister says upcoming elections have nothing to do with his country's move to take Israel to the International Court of Justice. Israel's denied the allegation that it's committing genocide in Gaza. Ronald, Ronald Lamola told us the case is not about scoring political points. There was no political consideration. We have been winning elections and we have been campaigning on this a matter of Israel and Palestine for many years. We have always believed in a two-state solution. But why now? But why, why now? I mean, why escalate this? I've now? already told you it's not now. We have been doing it all along. Even former President Mandela has done it. Mm. So it has been a long um, a, a, a project uh, and campaign, mm -hmm. as you have said yourself. It's a long-standing relations between uh, the ANC and the and 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 the people. Say, the organization of Arafat in, 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 right. in, in Palestine. Mm -hmm. So they, they, there is no consideration of elections at all. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the, the fact is that there is an ongoing genocide which is urgent, mm -hmm. which needed to be attended to. It has nothing to do with elections. You have heard, uh, we are campaigning here in South Africa, right. it's true. And yep. um, we deal with a number of issues, service delivery and so forth. Obviously, even international issues. but. The matter was taken to the court on the basis of principle and on the basis of our uh, signatory to the Genocide uh, mm -hmm. Convention. And I, and I also want to bring up, Minister, because there's been a lot of opposition uh, to this case in particular. We heard from the United States that called it unfounded, France saying that it crosses a moral threshold. Uh, Israel, of course, in opposition to it. I mean, were you surprised at just the level of criticism uh, that you got to bringing this case forward? Yeah, we're not really surprised. You're not the surprised. only thing that surprised us is that it was not uh, dismissed by substance, particularly by the U.S. You can't dismiss mm -hmm. an 84-page uh, document with just three lines that it uh, has got no substance, it meritless, and so forth. They need to provide a compelling argument provide substantive documents so that everyone can be able to see what is their point, what is the argument. It can also be, be engaged upon by both academics, intellectuals in the space, even the court itself. So anyone who has got a different view, that is what must do. And that is what South Africa has done. Mm. We have followed the rules of the court. We have um, uh, well detailed, forensically submitted our submission. That is what we expect. Mm. That will, will be what shows respect to other states. You can't just dismiss it with a three sentences. So it must be it? intellectually engaged. So we continue to engage with um, all the role players in the space and um, we believe that the superior logic is what must, uh, must prevail. That was the South African Justice Minister Ronald Lamola with Bloomberg's Jennifer Zabasaja. Uh, you can watch us live and see our past interviews on our interactive TV function, TV Go. There you can also dive into any of the securities or Bloomberg functions we talk about, plus become part of the conversation by sending us instant messages during our shows. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Check it out at TV Go.
Alibaba's US listed shares jumped after the New York Times reported that founder Jack Ma and chairman Joe Tsai have been buying in. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's executive editor for Asia Technology, Peter Elstrom. Uh, Peter, from the, from the reporting, it seems like perhaps they've been buying over a period of time now, but the stock jumped really quite significantly on Wall Street. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, we saw Alibaba's shares in the U.S. jump about uh, 8% uh, on this report. Just to clarify, there was actually a securities filing that disclosed Joe Tsai's purchases, and his purchases were actually quite a bit bigger than Jack Ma's uh, buy here. Jack Ma bought about $50 million in shares in Alibaba, and Joe Tsai bought $150 million. And just to be clear, Jack Ma is no longer involved in the company. He doesn't have a management role. Joe is actually guiding what's now kind of a restructuring. They're trying to get Alibaba Alibaba back on track after a clash with regulators in Beijing that really left what was once the most powerful technology company in China kind of in a difficult spot. Their market cap peaked uh, back in October of 2020. It got up to about $860 billion. Before this news came out, it was all the way down to $175 billion. That was largely because of these tensions with regulators over Alibaba's business model and its finance arm in particular. And now Joe Tsai is really leading this effort to get the company back on track to get the e-commerce business running again and also to get out from under the thumb of regulators in China. So is that the motivation for Jack Ma and Joe Tsai buying into this? Uh, what's the outlook for them? Well, of course, they're, they're not speaking publicly about this. We don't know exactly what their motivation is, but I think there are a couple of factors playing here. One is that shares appear to be quite um, uh, undervalued uh, at this point. I think both of the executives, if they feel like the company is still a strong business, still a strong opportunities in front of them, the idea that you can buy in at $175 billion market cap or perhaps even lower during this period, that's a good opportunity for them financially. Also, they know that it sends a very uh, strong signal of confidence in the business going forward. So if you're going to buy in like this, you're going to send a signal uh, to the employees, to your customers, to regulators, we believe in the company, we believe that the long-term prospects for Alibaba are quite strong. It certainly has been pulled back, it's been tamed from the Alibaba that we knew a couple of years ago, but it still has a dominant position in e-commerce and it has strong strategic positions in other areas too, including in finance. All right, Bloomberg's executive editor for Asia Technology, Peter Elstrom there. All right, that's just about it uh, for Bloomberg Daybreak Asia. Let's take a look at how futures are trading as we look ahead to the open markets in Hong Kong and China at the bottom of the hour. Um, it's going to be an interesting day, of course, for uh, China, of course, on the back of these reports uh, that there's going to be a fund uh, to prop up and stabilize what's been happening with, the, uh, with Chinese stocks. We'll also have a result for you, hopefully, from the New Hampshire primaries. Stay tuned for our special coverage next.